All right, now I've got, I've got a real silly question to start off the sermon tonight. Who here likes having freedom? Right? That's, a, that's a silly question, right? Everybody likes Who doesn't like having freedom? Right? I mean, everybody, everybody enjoys having freedom, whether you know it or not. People enjoy being free and not just being told what to do all the time and, and not you know, being so restricted by being under bondage and things like that. Now, I'm one that wants maximum freedom. Just to, just to give you a little bit about myself. I want the most freedom possible, you know, within this country, within the confines, with the government and everything else. I push for a world whose laws are limited to those of the Bible. Amen. Okay, this is, you, if you stacked up the Bible and the laws of the Bible compared to like the laws of just the state of Arizona, for example, I mean, I, I don't even know what all the laws are. I know I've been on the website and you see all the statutes and you see these laws and you see all these different things. I mean, it, it fills up a lot more content than this book does. And then you go into federal laws and, you know, and all, all these other laws and, and, and ordinances and local laws and everything else that we have. It piles up really, really, really high. I am one that doesn't, I'm, I'm not for all those laws. I'm for the real basic laws, the laws that God has laid out. I think God made his law perfect for us. And I wish that we, you know, I, I would like to go back to a time where this was held as the standard. And this is where we're going to determine what's right, what's wrong, what's against the law, what's the punishment going to be. And we're going to decide this based off of this book and where Jesus Christ himself can just be our ruler. As it was in the days before, uh, before King Saul, when they used to just have judges. And they'd have a man of God, someone who knew God's word, someone that, that, that God was able to use to just judge what was right and what was wrong based off of God's word. And it was a very, it was a very great time. It was, a, good, it was, it was a, a, a time of much freedom. People were able to do a lot of things. Now, obviously, there's, there's people who are going to be doing things that are wrong and wicked. But, you know, you can only make so many laws. So, like, the Bible gives us plenty of examples of laws that need to be punished. But there's a lot more sins than that, right? So it, one example of that is the Bible explains, you know, getting drunk, drinking alcohol, that's a sin. But there, not in one case does the Bible give you a punishment saying this should be against the law, right? It's, it's something that God tells us, you're not supposed to do this, I don't want you doing this, but it's not a law against it. Now, there's laws against, essentially, what we see here in this chapter. We could just look down real quick at, uh, in verse number 9, of Romans 13, it says, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, is briefly comprehending the saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Basically, what he's comprehending God's laws about is the way that you impact other people. When you, are, when you steal from somebody else, you're affecting that other person. Obviously, if you were to commit adultery, you are, you are hurting your, your spouse, and maybe someone else's spouse. You know, you're, you're doing damage unto somebody else. And essentially what God's saying here, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. That encompasses what the law is all about. And, and the laws that we should have should revolve around that, whether or not we're doing harm to someone else. We're stealing their property. We're, we're, we're murdering, so, you know, taking someone else's life or doing these types of things. Of course, of course we need laws against those things. And of course we need to have a punishment associated with those crimes. But we shouldn't just have laws against every single sin in the book. I mean, then we're all going to be criminals. We're all going to be thrown in jail. You know, it's just, there's, there's no hope because everybody's a sinner. But we ought to have a, a, a society in which it could be very simple, very basic, and it's based on God's laws. Now, I'm really into like, you know, the freedom movement. And I've, al I've always, you know, ever since probably around 2007, I started waking up to a lot of the concepts of freedom and things like that. And at one point early on, I used to think that the way to, to achieve you know, great freedom was going to happen through politics. It was going to happen through you know, running for office and doing all this stuff. And it didn't take very long before I realized what a sham it is and what, and what a bunch of baloney it is. You know, I went to some of these Republican meetings and all this other stuff, and it was all just a bunch of nonsense. You have all the, just the, the cronies that are there, people have invested in it and just doing favors for each other, and it's just a game. It's just, it's just a big scam. And honestly, though, even if it wasn't just a big sham, that's not the way to really get the change for freedom anyways. I mean, Jesus Christ is the one who ultimately brings freedom. He brings freedom from the bondage. We're in bondage of sin. 
When you get saved, Jesus Christ frees you from that bondage, and that is the best freedom to have. That is freedom from the punishment of, of eternity of hell. That is a freedom from the consequences for those sins in hell. And He frees us from that judgment. But more than just providing the freedom from the punishment for our sins, He gives us then the power to overcome our sins and, and, to, and to get out of that bondage, whatever that bondage might be. You know, a lot of people have a problem with alcohol or drugs or pornography or all kinds of other things that, that, that just keep them in bondage and they, they get addicted to things and they can't get away from them. Christ is going to get you out of that bondage and bring that freedom. And I decided long ago, which is why I'm standing here this evening pastoring a church, is because the way to achieve even ultimate freedom in, in, in our community, in the state, in the country, it's not going to be done through politics. It's going to be done through reaching the individuals, through changing hearts and minds through the power of the gospel. This is where the power truly lies. And if we're going to have any hope of anything, we have to reach the individuals and get into their hearts and get into their minds and get them to turn to the Lord. Because God's judgment is going to come. No matter who's in, the, in office, in the Oval Office, it doesn't matter what president we have. It doesn't matter who's in the Senate. It doesn't matter who's in Congress. It doesn't matter who's in these places. If the people is wicked, God's judgment is going to come upon us. And then we're all going into bondage. And there's no getting around it. God did that to his people Israel back, you know, a long time ago, back in the times of the kings. And when they turned their back on God and they forsook God and took up these false idols and false gods took them captive, took them out of the land, and then they were being bondmen and bondwomen for, for, you know, for uh, foreign nations, for the Babylonian Empire and other people, whereas if they would have just stuck serving the Lord, they would retain their freedom. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about activism because I follow, in, in the freedom movement, you know, this is, and this is, I'm talking about freedom movement like external to, to Christianity and stuff, just people who are in general for, you know, liberty-minded ideas. I like that because, I, I, like I said, I, I'm someone who really likes to have a lot of freedom. So I follow this on the side a little bit from time to time. You're on YouTube and things like that, and I'll read different, different blogs or whatever of people who are pro-freedom, and I, and I follow these activists. And they, they perform this activism, and, and obviously the word activism has to do with being active, right? They're actively doing something to evoke some kind of change, to get a point across, to bring attention to a certain matter that, that they believe is, is wrong. So they spend time promoting their ideals, oftentimes using some kind of creative ways. You know, sometimes an activist will challenge the legitimacy of a law by, by intentionally breaking that law and bringing it to court and, you know, and bringing this attention uh, about how ridiculous some of these things are. Um, one tactic that people will use is civil disobedience, which is just that you're breaking the law on purpose. You're doing something because you don't believe in it and you think it needs to be changed, so you'll go out and do it intentionally. Not, not, try, not intentionally doing harm to people, right? As, as a legitimate law would be, if you're doing harm to somebody else, well, yeah, there's a reason for that law. It should be in place. But this is people, you know, stupid things like, like how tall you, you know, if your grass is getting a little bit too big or something, they ultimately are going to end up throwing you in jail because of it. That's ridiculous. Or, or, you know, you could go on and on about the list of ridiculous laws that are out there of things that you could be, ex that you could be actually thrown in a cage because you're not following it. But, um, you know, one example would be some people who are, who are, re are pacifists are really opposed to war. Now, I'm not saying I'm a pacifist, but there's some people who are, you know, they, they take a really strong stand and say, you know what, I am opposed to all wars. I don't think there should be any wars. And the way that these wars are funded in our country is that, you know, your taxpayer money goes and funds that. So they take this and they say, you know what, I can't be responsible for dropping a bomb on innocent people. And they'll say, I'm not going to pay my taxes because we are, as long as we continue to do this, I won't do this. So they take this stand and it's a, it's a, it's a stand of civil disobedience. Okay, this is, and this is what a lot of activists will do, and they'll bring attention to it, be like, I'm not paying for this, and, and they'll say out loud in public, I'm not doing this, because I do not believe in this, and I do not support what our government's doing with this money, and I can't be a part of that, it goes against my conscience. Okay, now, I don't want to get too political tonight, because I, I'm bringing this up to just describe a little bit of activism. But what, the activism that I think we really need to be focused on is Christian activism, and that's the title of my sermon, is Christian Activism. Now, we started off here in Romans 13 because it's a, it's a passage that is very, very often abused. Abused extremely by churches that are trying to tell, that will try to tell you 
that this is telling you that whatever the government says, you just have to obey and you just have to do it and you just, just basically the government is boss and that you have to do whatever the government says. And that's to be a good Christian. You have to do, and, and they'll take this passage and they'll abuse it. Now, one of the ways that they do that, and, and I, you know, I didn't prepare this before the sermon, but I know, hopefully it's the, uh, there, are, there are obviously multiple types of Bible versions out there. Okay, and what I have in my hand, this is a, the living and NIV parallel Bible. And I'll read for you. I didn't, I didn't prepare this beforehand, but I know they, they butcher everything. And I've seen this before that uh, this is really, and it, and it really is different. You could follow, I'm going to read for you from Romans 13. And you'll see one of the reasons why there's, there's so many pastors out there, the ones that aren't King James only, the ones that are using these perversions of the Bible and teaching their congregation so that you have all these people walking away thinking that I need to obey. I need to do whatever the government says. I just have to do it. This is one of the main reasons why, why it's in there, why people are even teaching this. So you follow along and read your King James. You read the Word of God. In Romans 13, while I read from one of these perversions, let's see, let's start with the NIV because that's real popular. Yeah, and, and even in the title it says, Submission to the Authorities. That's, that's what this chapter is about. Okay. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant and agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. So, yeah, the, 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 the living Bible is even worse. If you can imagine that, even worse. Just the first verse, it says, Obey the government. <laughs> and those are, Obey the government. For God is the one who has put it there. Obey the government, for God is the one who has put it there, versus let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Those are not the same thing, okay? Not even close. So I assume if I was living in, you know, 1941 in Germany, and it says, obey the government, God put it there, Okay, I guess I'm just going to do everything they say. You know, Hitler sends me off to go fight in this war. I'm going to go do it, right? Or in Russia, under Stalin, obey the government. It's stupidity. It's sheer stupidity. Look, let's, I'm not going to, you know, and, and this is one of the reasons why, that's why I point this out. If you, if you read one of these garbage translations, it's not even, it's not even the Bible. It's not even God's word. It's a, it's a total perversion. It's a lie brought by Satan himself to just deceive people, get them confused, and to believe in, in, in things that are going to make you enslaved. Because that's what it is. It's an enslavement passage in those books. But let's look at Romans 13 because people still sometimes have a little bit of a problem with Romans 13 because of all this other brainwashing things that they hear of people telling you, no, no, you just always have to obey. A good Christian is just always going to obey the government all the time no matter what. Bible says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. So God has ordained powers. It doesn't say God ordained this government or this specific government and just obey the government all the time. He's ordained powers. Now God has established varying um, institutions that have power. And they have a realm of authority. For example, God has established the family. And God has set the husband as the, the, the head of that household, of the family, who is the one that's at the top, and that the, the wife is to be in submission to the husband, and the children, of course, are being in submission to the parents. And that is the, the power structure that God has ordained within the family. God has ordained a power structure of government. 
he has. Now, it's not the government, like just any government that exists is just automatically what, doing what God has established for it to do. But the role of the human government that God has, the power that he's given unto that is to punish the evildoers, is to be the ones that you can go to when someone does commit a crime and there does need to be a sentencing carried forth and, and there needs to be a punishment dealt out. Because God has ordained things like the death penalty, for example. And he did not establish it so that if someone were to just to come and kill my wife, that I just go and kill that person and just, and just completely be the, the judge, jury, and executioner of that crime. That's not the way God ordained it. He wanted things to be done in, in a lawful manner so that people can have, you know, uh, due process isn't in the Bible, but the concepts there is that there's due diligence to search out the truth of a matter so that people who are a little bit more objective can determine if someone's lying, if someone's telling the truth, what's the evidence, and then determine the guilt or innocence of a person. It makes perfect sense. And that is a job that was given unto a government. That is a power and authority that God has established. It doesn't mean that everything the government says is, is under the power of God and that God put there. I mean, there's some people that say, well, Barack Obama's our president, so like God, God put him there. God knows what he's doing. That's what He's ordained by God to be our president. I don't buy that for a second. The only way I would buy that, if God put him there, it's for judgment on us on a wicked people. That's the only reason why he would be put in that position. It's not because God wants him to be our ruler because he's such a great man. That's not it at all. But let's continue reading because this is what it's talking about powers. This is a lot more abstract than the government. It says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Before I move on from this idea of, the, of these powers, there are, even in this country, the way the government is established, we have a law of the land, supposedly, that is supposed to be like the law of the land. That's supposed to be the ultimate power or authority is under the Constitution of the United States, right? And then you have, um, of course, you know, individual states and then local, you know, areas and stuff. But, if, but in any of those cases, if, if a state or someone else makes a law that, that is contrary to what the Constitution says. The Constitution ultimately is supposed to be the, the supreme law of the land. It's supposed to carry that weight so that nobody can make laws that would be unconstitutional. That's why you always have laws going to court to figure out are they constitutional or not. Does this, does this um, contradict the, the freedoms that are outlined? And actually, you know, and this is the wrong mindset too. I don't want to get too political on, on our particular Constitution tonight, but it's irritating because People have come to think that it's the Constitution that grants you freedom. No, the Constitution doesn't grant freedom at all. The Constitution actually was designed to do was to restrict government. That you already have your freedoms. That was the intent. When it was written, it was, it was assumed and known. Man has their freedom. No one's going to be telling them what to do, but, but here's, we're, we're establishing this government to carry out this sentence and to try to ensure that freedom for people. And in order to try to ensure that, the Constitution was supposed to be restricting the powers that the government has. That was the intent. And that was the purpose, was, was to keep the government back from growing out of control. Now, obviously, there's problems with our Constitution because look at where the government is today. It's grown out of control. But that was the whole point. And it's because people don't care about the Constitution. No. It's people come into power and they want more power and they, you know, and, and they become corrupt and whatever. But that's a, that's a whole other story. I really don't want to get that, that into the politics of our country because to me, it's just kind of boring. I'd rather focus on what's right and what the Bible is actually saying here so that you don't get turned around or twisted by somebody trying to tell you you always have to submit to what you know the government says as you know reading from the the new living bible or whatever obey the government verse number three it says for rulers are not a terror to good works this is the power that god has ordained is that the rulers are not to be a terror to good so if you're doing something good the ruler shouldn't be coming down if you're doing good so what's to happen though if Someone makes soul winning illegal, going out and preaching the gospel, just knocking on people's door and giving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, that's illegal in many countries. Now, if the ruler of that country says this is illegal, does that just mean, well, I guess I'm just gonna, gonna listen to the government and obey the government? No, that person has stepped outside of their realm because now they're being a terror to good works. God hasn't ordained that power. They don't have that power given to them of God. It has no... 
authority, no weight, no bearing, no reason to obey that power. Now, we should be obeying the powers if they are acting within the power that God has granted unto them to be a terror unto, unto the evil works, not unto good works. Hey, if you're doing good, you shouldn't have to face any consequences, any problems when you're doing good, when you're doing what's right, when you're not harming other people, when you love your neighbor as yourself, and, and, and obeying God's laws. Hey, the rulers are not there to do anything to you whatsoever. He says, but to the evil, wilt, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. So he's saying, you know, when you do that which is good, you should also be getting praise from, from these rulers that have this power. You should be getting praise of the same. The same people that are a terror to the bad works should be praising the good works. It says, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. And he's, he's trying to explain here, look, these powers were day of God so that to, to basically keep people in line so that when you do something bad, you should be afraid. You should be worried about that, that there is going to be a judgment that comes. And it's not just from God. It's in, it's in our local government. There's going to be people who are going to bring you to trial and, and, and you're going to face some kind of a punishment for what you've done. And we should be fearful of that because God has ordained the power of man to do that. For example, the death penalty itself was not ordained until after the flood. It wasn't until after Noah got off of the, the ark that God made the decision because the reason the flood even came is because the wickedness of man was great in the earth. That, that people would just started doing wickedly. After um, Cain slew Abel, then people just got more and more and more wicked and were just doing these bad things. Until finally, God just said, I'm done. I'm wiping everybody out. I'm wiping everything out. Uh, it repenteth me that I even made man. He's sorry he even made man. Because of, because of the wickedness that they had gotten into. But one of his solutions then to that was, okay, after the flood, now Noah, you know, it, whosoever killeth man or sheddeth blood by man, you know, by man shall his blood be shed. So he, he ordains that law that now I'm going to allow you to end somebody's life. He had, you know, Noah, no one had that, that authority by God to take somebody else's life until after the flood where God says, now I'm giving this power unto you that is ordained by me, ordained by God to take somebody else's life. But it's in this scenario. In the, if, if somebody goes and kills somebody else, then yes, now you take that person's life and blood will be shed for blood. And then, of course, we go into the Mosaic Law, which gives a lot more uh, details on those, those types of laws. But that is a power that's ordained by God. But that specifically, and the Bible lays out what is right and what is righteous as far as the powers that, that the human government even has. Verse 5 says, um, Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake, for for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. And this is actually interesting because this is something that, um, you know, there's a lot of people that, that don't agree with paying taxes. And I don't want to get too much into that, but this is saying it's legitimate to pay the person who is doing God's will and, and, and doing this, uh, this judgment and stuff um, when... When he's, when he's performing his job the way he ought to be, that, that yeah, okay, that's why you pay tribute. That's why you, you do pay for these people to, to do this job, because it is a job. Because it's not just, uh, you know, you need to do research, you need to be confronted with the evidence. It takes a lot of time to do this. And he's saying that that's, uh, for this cause, pay ye tribute also. For they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. It doesn't mean if you want to own property, then it's okay for the government just to take a portion of your, you know, to, to charge, to tax you every year by this percent or whatever. It's not, that's not what he's saying is okay. It's for one specific job here that is very, very, very minimal in its scope and its compass. Verse 7, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another, man, another hath fulfilled the law. And then he goes on to explain, of course, the, you know, he goes into the Ten Commandments, so, you know, part of them, and basically saying that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And it's no coincidence that this is all found within this same chapter where he's describing the powers that are given by God. Because these are the things that they should be looking at and that they are, they are given the authority over to judge and to... And to to dictate is, is these laws that God has given unto us. 
not just making up a whole bunch of other rules and laws and that you just have to be subject to all these other things. That's not right. Um, some people think that, well, o the only time, the only time that you can disobey, you know, a government law is if, is if it contradicts what the Bible says. Now, I don't really take that stand. I think that the only time it even has power or authority is when they're under their scope of authority. It doesn't necessarily have to kind of... I'll give you an example. If I were to tell Mrs. Tiburic something that I, that I, that I want you to do this, right? As, as if I'm her husband. That's not necessarily contradicting anything in the Bible. I would say, I need you to make me dinner tomorrow night. Right? If I were just to say, like, do I have any authority over... Brother, Brother Sebastian's wife at all. None. Zero. Right? I, uh, now, I have that authority over my wife. I said, wife, I want you to make me dinner tomorrow at 6 o'clock. I have been given that authority by God to, to be able to, to say something like that. And, and it would be legitimate. I have no legitimate. Now, me saying that is it, there's no contradiction in the, you know, I'm not disobeying God's law by, 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 you know, or, or, you know, for her to obey that or to disobey that. You can't say, well, it's not going against the Bible, so I, I better do it than just be in subjection. No. And, you know, in making that analogy, the whole point is that just because the government says to do something, it doesn't mean it's operating under its scope of authority. Even if it's not something that's contradictory to the Bible, if it's outside of their realm, I mean, if they're telling you what to eat every day, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to just obey it just because the government said so. You say, well, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can't eat what they're saying to eat, so you better just eat it. No. That's stupid. <laughs> they don't have that authority. <clears throat> One of the things I found a little bit discouraging is, there was an incident that I was involved in a couple years ago at, uh, with the Border Patrol. And of course, it wasn't at a border. We weren't crossing any borders. We were driving within the United States. And, you know, they have these Border Patrols set up. And I didn't, you know, it's one of those things where, could I have just said, yes, I'm a U.S. citizen and just gone through? Of course I could have. But that's not the point. I was, I was trying to make a point that, you know, these things are illegal. We shouldn't be subject now to this growing police state of, of being stopped, even just traveling throughout the country. I, you know, I should be free to travel from one place to another unmolested without any, you know, there's no probable cause. There's no, there's no reason of suspicion. I'm driving my minivan with my family through the country, haven't crossed any borders, haven't done anything, and, and now I'm just being stopped and interrogated. And I'm going to resist that. And all these people, all these Christians are, you know, down on me. I just got a, a comment recently on Facebook or something saying, oh, you, you know, you're not submitting to, to the government and you're, you know, all this other stuff. And people have just been brainwashed into thinking that you have to, you know, and oh, these guys are just doing their job. They should be getting a different job. When they're, when, when they're doing things that are, that I believe are, they're unlawful and they're harassing people within their own country. Look, get a different job. That's not right. That's, I don't want to live in a place that's, you know, people, oh, well, then you should go, you should move then, move out of the country. Look, no, I'm not moving anywhere. This country isn't going to turn into a police state. I don't need to move somewhere else for this country to be back to, to what it started as and, and what the, the original thought was. Just because the communists want to take over and, and, and socialize everything and, and feel, feel somehow feel secure and safe. Oh, well, I feel safer that they're asking somebody if they're a citizen. Because an illegal alien's gonna say, no, I'm not a citizen. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. As criminal, we should, you know what? We should just do that for everybody. Have you robbed a bank today? Oh yeah, yeah oh great. That, that sounds like a great way to do police work, right? To, to, to catch criminals. We'll just start asking everybody if you've done something illegal. Because that's how we'll catch them. But that's not what it's all about. Those things aren't about, they're not about catching illegal immigrants. A drug checkpoint is what it is. But they can't legally do it because it's already been banned for them to just set up checkpoints for drugs. So they come up with another way around it just to, to, to and ultimately, you know what it is? The love of money. Because the drug, they don't even care. They don't care about the drugs. They don't care about you. They don't care about your kids getting into drugs. They care about making cash. Because it's lucrative. 
because they make a lot, a lot, a lot of money from their seizures, from their drug seizures, from all these things that they take and grab and it goes into their pockets. That's what they care about. And that's the truth. And you know, if you don't believe me, look it up. And you, you see me after service, you don't believe me, I will point you and show you the facts on that matter. But I digress. I had this, this incident and people, you know, again, I, I'm trying not to get too political because it, that, none of that stuff is even the, the main point. The main point I want to make with even bringing that up, the reason why I answered the way I did, and I made mistakes and stuff, and I already said, I, I gave up the, the information that they were looking for anyways, where I said, I can't even drive within my own country. Look, I know I made a mistake, okay? It's the only time I've ever been through a checkpoint. I was on vacation, I was driving, and I didn't want to have to deal with it, but I, I slipped up and said something that, that you know, gave them the information. Oh, they, you just told them you're a citizen. Okay, I did, fine, whatever, you know, but I was still made my point. And, you know, a bunch of people saw it. And here's the thing, though, is that with the Internet today and everyone having these video cameras on their phones, it's become very interesting the amount of attention that could be brought to, to specific issues such as this one. Prior to me driving through that, I had seen, a, you know, a, a bunch of other videos of other people resisting and showing, hey, here's something you could do. Because most of the time, people are generally sheep. And look... I am also sometimes, too, I think everybody is. Even if you're a leader, people still have this sheep ten tendency to kind of go with the flow in different things. Now, obviously, it depends on what level it is and, and how extreme things are. But a lot of times, people just, just get into a routine of just doing, oh, okay, yeah, fine, whatever. And you get, you get irritated with it. But you don't necessarily think out and say, you know what, I'm actually going to stand up to this because this isn't right. And you start giving it more thought. And now what's cool with the technology is you can see this and be like, yeah, you know what? This isn't right. And I'm going to make a stand too. And you, you can start seeing what other people are doing and getting involved in a way that if you just thought that you were doing it, you'd be like, well, what's the point? If I alone, if there's one person that does this one thing, you think, well, what's the point? It's like voting, right? I mean, like, like my vote's going to count. Right? What is my one vote going to do? What is my one, you know, standing up at this point going to do? Well, if it, was, if it was just completely unknown and you were just there and people were just looking out their cars and be like, yeah, come on, just hurry up, get out of here. But when you, start, when you start to use these tools that we have now, the technology you can put it out there, you get a lot more people involved. And now people can see what other people are doing and start doing the same thing. And pretty, pretty soon you actually can have some kind of an impact. Now... The reason why I bring that up is because I want to apply this to Christianity, to Christian activism, to doing things that... And look, I'll keep doing those types of things because I don't want there to be... You know, I'm sick of the police state that's growing in this country and I'm going to do what I can to, to stop that. But that's not my primary focus or goal. I'm not going around you know, intentionally trying to get involved in these types of fights. If it comes to me, if I'm driving through, if, they, if that happens, then yes, I will stand up for my rights and for my freedom and not, and not let that be infringed as much as possible. But what I'm going to actively try to do is to get Christians activated to do other things. So I think it's great now, and I've, I've started to see a little bit of a trend lately. Um, with, you know, Pastor Anderson's been doing these soul winning marathons in different areas. And I think it's great. And I think we need to do more of this. I think we need to do more of the the videos and the uploads and, and people seeing this on social media and getting more and more emboldened to go out and do things that are right. People who might have thought at one time, yeah, I know I should give the gospel. Yeah, I know I should, I should, I should stand for Christ. Yeah, I know I should, I should preach about Jesus, but I don't really know how. I have not really done this before. The cool thing about, about the social media and the, and the videos and stuff, and supposed to, you could start having an influence more on people now to show them, hey, this is how it's done. I guarantee you, if I would have never seen a video on the, on the whole Border Patrol thing and other people doing this, I probably wouldn't have done it. I would have just, just passed on through. Now look, that's a, that's a minor issue. That's not a big deal. But when you, you think about the power that technology has with that, to, to influence people, to, see it, to really get them to think and be like, you know what, yeah, this is right. I am going to do this. I am going to stand up with the things of God. I am going to go out and preach the gospel to people. I, hey, look, they're doing it. Hey, these people are doing it. I, I should be doing it too. And it could help encourage and embolden people to do that. Now turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 16. Acts 
Actually, you know what? No, turn to Philippians 1. I'm sorry. We, we might get back to Acts 16 if there's time. I just wanted to point out something about, you know, people gave me a hard time about, you know, having an attitude with people that, that are just trying to, to infringe on your rights. And, and, you know, we can see from the Bible, people like the Apostle Paul, especially, who's been in prison many times, and they'll say, oh, yeah, I know, but, but he, uh, you know, but he was in prison for doing the will of God and doing the work of God. Yes, he was. I'll grant you that. So, and I wasn't thrown into prison. But we see the way that Paul dealt with these people when he was thrown into prison. And we're not going to turn there, but in Acts 16, he basically says, you know, he was, he was arrested and he was beaten and he was put in prison for doing nothing wrong. There was just this uproar and people were making accusations against him. He was in prison and then they wanted to let him go. And he's like... Hey, they've beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. And they found out that, you know, and he, and he tell them, look, we're Roman citizens. And they've beaten us and imprisoned us. No, they could come over here themselves and get us out. Oh, why do you have to have that attitude, Paul? Oh, why, why can't you just go? I mean, they, they freed you. Why don't you just go? Why do you have to make a big stink out of it, Paul? Because he's a Roman citizen. Because he's supposed to have these rights. And he wants to prove it and make a point out of it. And say, you shouldn't be doing it. Yo, you're wrong by beating me and imprisoning me. I have rights, is what he was doing. Okay? And the reason why he was in prison isn't the point that I'm trying to make. It's the point of how is he dealing with these people. There's nothing wrong. You can't say, you know, people have this false concept of Christianity of thinking that you just have to be some limp-wristed sissy of a man to be a Christian. And that you just have to roll over for everybody and not say anything that might possibly offend somebody or say something in a way that's just, just not too kind. And that's how you're going to be a Christian. That's false. That's not, the way, that's not the way the men of the Bible act. Now look, I'm not for just being a total jerk and like, you know, demeaning people unnecessarily or whatever. Like, that's not what I'm saying either, but all I did was trying to prove a point, right? In, my, in, my, in, in the, the thing that, that I dealt with. And there's nothing wrong with calling people out and saying, no, we've got rights, we've got freedom, and standing up for those rights. And calling people out and saying, no, why don't you come here yourself? Why don't you get off your rear ends and come down here and let me out? And that's what he did. And then they came and, and asked them to go out. And, you know, and it's that type of an attitude, too. See, that, this is another reason why the attitude is important, because government is, is ultimately, especially in our society, is supposed to be the servant. They're supposed to be there to serve us, not the other way around. We're not the servants to the government. The government's there to serve and to protect us, just like the police, right? Serve and protect. They are the, they're, they're the, they're the ones that are, that we are the bosses and they're the servants. They're there for us. And the mentality is shifted. And when the mentality shifts, tyranny comes. When you have a government that's saying that, no, we're, we're in charge and we're going to tell you what to do, as opposed to the people saying, no, we're telling you what to do. We're giving you our money. We're telling you what to do. That's when you have tyranny because then you have a small group of people in this power that, that are just going to enslave the masses. And, and when you don't stand up Especially if you're a man and you don't have a backbone, you don't have a spine to be able to stand up to people and let them know where you stand and say, you're not going to do this to me. And, and the more you just keep, it's like a bully. You know, a bully comes up to you at school and takes your lunch money and you just, you just keep, oh, here you go. Oh, here, guess what? He's going to keep on bullying you more and more and more and more. Well, that, the money's not enough. Now give me that jacket. Now give me those shoes. And he's going to keep on bullying to you until you stand up and do something about it. Well, the government's the same way. They're a bunch of bullies trying to steal, steal from you. You need to be able to stand up and say, no, I've got, I've got rights. I'm not going to let you bully me around. I mean, th that's what's happening now. And, you know, and don't take this wrong. I'm not this, this huge fan. I don't even know much about the lady, but that was her name. Kim Davis, I think, was the, the one that was not, not um, given the, the homos their, their marriage licenses or whatever. Like she, was, she, she, she went to jail for and all this other stuff. Look, I don't know what she's all about. You know, she's probably real liberal, whatever. But we need to see more of that, people standing up and making this type of a stand. Because there are a lot of people out there that agree. But the problem is people are not vocal. They don't say anything. They're, they're too quiet. They're timid. They're intimidated 
by what the opposition might do. Because you have this extremely fervently vocal minority of sodomites that'll go on the attack and try to slander you and cause you all kinds of problems and ruin your business and do everything else when you stand up against their agenda. And too many people are willing and have the guts to stand up and just say, no, you're perverted. You're sick. You're not going to get away with your agenda. And, you know, especially if you have children, you ought to be standing up and screaming from the housetops. I know I don't want my kids growing up in a society that's run by perverts and sodomites and trying to tell them that transgenderism and people turning from boys to girls and girls to boys is normal and acceptable and we should just be loving of it. And that anyone can use any restroom they want and, and, and it's, it's filthy and disgusting and wicked and, and completely foreign. I don't understand it one bit. They're trying to normalize this stuff because they're wicked and evil. We can't, we can't let that go on, my friends. You're in Philippians 1? Yes. Look at, uh, at verse number 12. Because, see, oftentimes people will, once you see someone else going through something or hearing about it, then that's enough to help you to determine what you're going to do when you're put in a similar situation. And that's where I was going with the whole, you know, videos and putting stuff on, uh, online where, you, where other people can see that and learn and say, like, oh, wow, this is an option. This is actually something I could do. Look, there's other people doing this. This is something that I think I should be doing too. Philippians 1 actually tells us a little bit about that. Verse number 12, But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. This is the Apostle Paul writing, talking about the things that have happened to him and him being thrown in prison. Verse number 13, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, look at this, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He's basically saying, because I've done this, because I've set the way, I've been a trailblazer, I'm going forward and I'm being bold and I'm preaching the gospel and I'm getting thrown in prison. He's saying, other people now are seeing this. They're getting stirred up. Now, maybe they're getting stirred up. They're saying, hey, that's not right. You can't throw them in a prison for that. And now they're going to go out and, and preach the word that he's doing. Or they're saying, hey, he's already been doing this. What are we doing sitting on our rear ends? Let's get up and do this. And he's emboldening people to do this through his own actions. And anytime you have a great leader, that you, you should be finding that happening as well. But we have such great tools at our fingertips to be able to reach people in a way with, with again, with the internet and with, and with this social media to be able to show people, look, this is what we're doing. We need to be emboldening other people to speak the word without fear. Because what happens is when people think they're all alone in a certain, in a certain way of thinking, well, I mean, if you're, if you're watching TV, if you're watching the news, if you're listening to the radio, you're listening to everything the world is pumping into you, you're going to start thinking that, you know, the sodomites is normal, that it's just fine and everything's great. And I don't know why I'm so weird into thinking that it's wrong or immoral or, or anything like that. You start to feel isolated and feel alone when you're not. At all, but you're being inundated with all this other brainwashing and all this other, you know, um, way of thinking about this, which is completely wicked, into thinking that it's normal when it's not. And when nobody is saying anything, you might feel like you are absolutely alone, but you're not. And we need to be able to be the lights that God has made us. If you have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you because you're born again, because you're a saved child of God, hey, God didn't give you that light to put under a bushel. He wants that light to shine. That light needs to shine so that everybody can see it. And when everyone sees it, again, it gives, it gives more people the boldness to come out and do these things. Verse number 15, it keeps on explaining. It says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So he's saying some people are preaching Christ because they think it's going to make things even worse for me in prison. They're trying to, to add to my afflictions. They're trying to make things even worse. And other people... 
They're doing it with a pure heart. They're doing it for the right reason. You know, they're preaching Christ because they know they should be preaching Christ. He's saying, but hey, I don't care. Either way, whether you're doing it to try to cause me harm or whether you're not, Christ is being preached. And that's why I, you know, no publicity is bad publicity. I don't care when they, you know, they could come and, and picket our church and, and do all these things. Hey, the message is being spread abroad, my friends. Bring it on. Whether in pretend, if you, you want to try to bring public backlash against what we believe because we believe what the Bible says literally, bring it on. Because that just means God's word is going to get out so much the more. The more people see Christians standing up and taking bold stances, not backing down to the pressure of the world and actually going out and doing something for Christ, they're going to be more bold to go out and do something themselves. Turn if you would to Ephesians 6. It'll be the, uh, the last place, I think the second to last place that we turn. Ephesians chapter 6. See, we have to understand there's a power structure in place today. We are in a war. You say, well, we're in peacetime. No, we're in a war. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. And we need to not make a mistake about this because there are powers that are, there are evil powers that are at work even today. And I'm not just trying to do this to be scary or something like that. It's the truth. And Ephesians chapter 6 will explain that. Look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He's admonishing people, look, be strong in the Lord. You don't want to be a weakling in the Lord. You need to be strong. He's going to explain why. Put on the whole armor of God. Armor. We need to be ready to fight. That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why? Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. These things exist. There is spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a darkness to this world. There are dark, evil people that have power today that are behind the scenes. You may not even know who they are, but they are there trying to promote filth and sodomy and everything that's against God. And they're out there and they're working hard. And this is the war and the battle that we are in. We are wrestling against these things. But in order to do well, we need to have armor. We need to be strong in the Lord. We need to make sure that we're in this book, that we have the truth on our side and that we're doing what's right. That's why he said verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Because the force is a strong force to reckon with. Hey, you need to be armed. You need to be strong or else they're going to knock you down. They're going to run all over you. You need to be ready to fight. Turn if you would to Acts chapter 5. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Acts chapter 5. Part of the wickedness in the high places that is known today, that, that we see some of the efforts that they have, is, is actually incorporated into churches. If you haven't heard about it, there's this thing that, that's been, uh, that the government has come out with, the clergy response team. Now, this is old news. It's been around for, well, at, least, at least it came out to the public, I don't know, like, I want to say almost 10 years ago now, I think, when it was first broke um, ab about this happening. But it's basically a coordinated effort between the government and pastors of churches for when there's emergencies, for the pastors to be able to calm the people down and to be able to say, just listen to what the government says and to go to Romans 13 and say, see, and use the New Living Translation and say, obey the government. See, the Bible says obey the government. When they come through and they ask you to give up your guns and they tell you, nope, this is all for your good and it's for your safety. Come with us now. We've got this camp all set up and it's ready for you. We're going to take care of you. They, they, literally, they have the pastors in place that they work with of these big mega churches where they have this great influence over people to tell them, no, no, listen to them. We need to obey the government. Hey, God is using this government to protect you and to look after you. And people are going to be buying it hook, line, and sinker. We need to be aware that these things exist. They put this in place. I think it was after the, the whole Katrina thing, the Hurricane Katrina, when they did send people out and they did take people's guns. And, and because it was a national emergency, you know, it, was a, it, was a, it was a local emergency, 
or it was a national emergency, I think, is what it was escalated to to get the funds or whatever. But they were putting people in the FEMA camps to help them out, and and it was you know they were they were hauling people out of their houses for their own good because the government knows better. People who say no, I want to stay in my house. I don't want people you know thieves coming in and stealing my stuff. And you know it's it's the flood's not that bad here. Look, and if I die here, look, that's my choice. I want to stay here. And the government says nope. You're coming with us. Out. You got any guns? Give them to me. That's what they did. That's a fact. That's a fact. And there's still people that haven't gotten their firearms returned. Because the government just came in and confiscated them. And that's, that's a very small scale. That's one event. But they're preparing for this on a large scale. And we need to make sure that we are ready. And honestly, you know, physically ready, yeah, great. But way more important than that is spiritually ready. We need to be prepared with the truth to be able to, to be voices, to, to shout against the evilness and the wickedness that's going on in this country and be able to, to proclaim that, you know what, I don't care what the government says, I don't care what anyone says, I'm going to stand for God. And that's what we're going to see. Look at Acts chapter 5. It's a great sentiment in Acts. I love the, man, the book of Acts is my favorite book in the whole Bible. I love it. I love the fact that there's people out there doing work for God, turning the world upside down with their doctrine and with their acts, with their actions, because they're actually doing things. They're not just coming to church and sitting down and then going home and doing nothing until the next week where they come in and go to church and then go back and sit down and do nothing. They're taking action. That's what the church is all about. That's what we need to be doing is going out and promoting God's word, getting souls saved, making differences in people's lives and getting their hearts right with God. That's what we need to be doing. But look at verse number 25 of Acts chapter 5. We're kind of cutting in the middle of the story here, but we're going to start reading verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. And you know what? That's the attitude that we need to have. They're saying, What are you doing? We already told you. Didn't we already beat you up and tell you, hey, not to preach in Jesus' name and not to do all this stuff? And, and, and why are you still doing this? Look, if you keep, you're spreading the whole, all Jerusalem with your doctrine. And this is the acts that they were doing. They were filling Jerusalem with this doctrine. Because they were going out and doing it and talking to people and preaching the word. That's not going to happen if you're not getting up and doing it. I'm only one person. Pastors in general, I mean, it's one person. Look, it's the whole church that needs to come together and go out and do this work. It's the only way you're going to be able to fill Prescott Valley. You're going to be able to fill Phoenix. You're going to fill these areas. Like they filled Jerusalem with this doctrine as if everybody's going out and participating and being part of the work. And have this attitude that when someone tells you not to do it, you say, well, I'm going to obey God, not man. Amen. I don't care what you say. I'm obeying what God told me to do. It's the same attitude that, that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had in the book of Daniel. You remember when uh, you know, the king Nebuchadnezzar said, look, you need to bow down and worship this image. When the music plays, you better be bowing down. They didn't do it. Everybody else did. They didn't do it. And I love the response. This is one of my favorite responses of all time in the Bible. They say um, when, when um, the king confronts them, it says, you don't have to turn. I'll just read this for you. We're going to close with, this ver with these verses. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. So we don't have to choose our words carefully. We already know what, what you know, we're not afraid of you at all. He says, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. He said, We know our God is capable of doing this. If he's going to save us, he will save us. And we have no doubt about that. But if he chooses not to, he says, Look, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. See, either way, whether he allows us to be thrown in that furnace or not, <laughs> you better be sure one thing, King, we're not bowing down. You're not breaking us. We're standing up for something. We're standing up for the Lord. 
And that's the attitude that we need to have. Christians today need to have. Now, I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to back down on the homo marriage. I'm not going to back down on, on any of my sins. I'm not going to back down one bit on what the Bible says. Just because it's not popular today. Just because someone's going to look at me funny. Just because you know family might, might disassociate themselves with me. I don't care. I'm not careful to answer in these matters. If the Bible says it, it's true. We need to get some more Christian activism. We need people to take action today and do more for the Lord. And you know, everyone just, just you know, analyze yourself. Look, I know I need to be doing more. And I'm taking this just as personally as anyone else should. If we really want to have an impact and you really care about the cause of Christ, take it on yourself to, to go out. And hey, be it not just completely alone, but just you know, be a part of the church. That's what the church is. If you've got a good church like, like you know, here or down in, in Phoenix or any, you know, anywhere there's a good church, be a part of that church. It's, it's all, it's all the, the better for you. It's going to be more emboldening and more helpful to be able to be a part of a congregation like that. They'll help you to go out and you can, it, you can make all kinds of change. And there's a lot of change needed in this country. There's a lot of people that, uh, that need Christ. And, and there's a lot of wickedness going on that needs to be preached against. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for making that free to us, dear Lord. We thank you that uh, you loved us enough that even though we're sinners, that you've, you've decided to pay the debt that we owe completely for free. And uh, we thank you for offering that to us, dear Lord, and for giving us eternal life. And I pray that you would please just help us to be stirred up, to not just to be hearers of the word, but not doers, but that we would... We would get up and, and decide, you know what, I'm going to do something for God and, and help us to, be, to have the courage and the strength to be able to not back down from your word and what it says. And, and you know, one of the only ways we're going to be able to do that, Lord, is if we even know what your word says. I pray that you please help us all to, to make the time in our schedules to read the Bible daily, dear Lord, to make it a part of our life, to, to, to learn it and to know it so that we won't back down on it because we know what your book says, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.